Fox here and we are going to look at the second half of the uh, op amp data sheet uh, we're finally getting back to it uh, in my website we've talked about uh, capacitors inductors and frequency response phase shift and all those good things so we are now at the point where we can talk about the AC part of, uh, of this op amp so very first page we got a magic number right here and we'll talk more about it but most of the part of this page is still the DC stuff that we had already talked about we go to the second page of the uh, of the data sheet which is the third page of the PDF and as we look at it we'll see that uh, there's capacitors in this thing and when there's capacitors, there's probably something happening to frequency response. Not only are there capacitors, there's a whole bunch of transistors built in each one of these, and a diode. And so that gets into, those also have capacitance. And we talked about that in a post that I did called the Magic Crystal. And uh, so we're going to have something happen in frequency. Absolute maximum ratings all have to do with uh, DC and temperature. We've talked about that. So we're going to, and we're going to skip this page temporarily. We're going to go straight into the meat of it. We're going to look at the frequency response. Okay, this plot right in here says open loop frequency response. That means there is no feedback. And as you can see, the gain is very, very high. 100, almost up to 120. So they had to run a very, very small signal through this thing to keep it from uh, from saturating. And when they did, uh, with the open loop, it started dropping off a little bit over 10, 10 hertz. Hertz, no kilohertz, 10 hertz. And uh, as you can see, it drops off at about 20 dB per decade, in other words, telling us that it is a uh, simple, what we call first order filter there. It's a low pass filter. And so there's some capacitance that's killing things off, running it off to ground, in other words. So, that is the open loop response. Now, if you go back to that open loop response but you start looking at how much is changing with phase you see that that starts to drop off the, I'm sorry the phase starts got 180 degrees phase shift so they run it into the uh, negative uh, well, it, it would be coming as if it was coming back to the to inverting input 180 degrees phase shift is a really really good thing or 180 degrees phase margin but that phase margin starts dropping off and becoming less because the capacitors take some time to charge and discharge. And uh, as they become less, right here at about 13 megahertz, it reaches unity gain, which if you follow this chart straight up, that's about where it hits the 0 dB point or unity gain point. Meanwhile, you still have about 55 degrees of phase margin, so this thing's not going to oscillate, and that's a really good thing. And uh, that's all they're proving with this right in here is the phase margin, which we just talked about in the very last post I did uh, on my website, what phase margin means. But it means that when you connect the output back into the input onto the inverting side, uh, you're still going to be having a signal that's out of phase enough that it's going to uh, not oscillate. It's actually going to be pretty stable with this this amount of phase gain. Of course, once you do that, you no longer have open loop, but hey, test one piece at a time, right? Okay, this right in here, they ran a large signal into it. They had to be running millivolts, even probably less, into this one over here. And once we go to this other one, 
they're running a signal of 23, no, 26 volts peak to peak, I would say. Uh, so that means plus or minus 13. They're running that into a, a voltage follower. A voltage follower is this circuit right here where you have unity, you have zero feedback resistance. And by doing that, you have a, a what's called a voltage follower. The output exactly follows the input. And it all works until you get up here to about 13 kilohertz. And then it starts dropping off and dropping off pretty quickly. However, look at this plot. It's measuring the output voltage peak to peak. So that means that the, uh, the input, the... Uh, Get my brain to work in here. <laughs> measuring the output voltage peak to peak and not measuring dB gain. So this plot does not have, has not been modified to uh, show the exponential form of it or the logarithmic form. It's just basically one to comparing one to one. However, it starts falling off a whole bunch once you get to. Uh, about 13 kilohertz. Okay, now we go into some of these numbers that they have up here that also are kind of telling us the same thing. Some of us actually read stuff instead of just looking at the pictures. Uh, not very often though. Give me the pictures usually. Okay, we're going to deal with this because we just talked about dBs since the last time I had this last uh, the last video. DB, if you remember, is the output divided by the input. You take the log log base 10 of that and then you multiply it by 20 to come up with a DB if you're comparing votes. And uh, 90 DB is quite a bit of rejection ratio and so this would be a minus 90 if you did that formula I just did. And uh, that means that if the power supply changes, that uh, the voltage changes on the power supply, it's not going to be seen on the output, or not very much of it's going to be seen on the output. And uh, that's a good thing. 90 dB is a pretty good rejection ratio. Same thing, this number right in here is also 90 dB called common mode rejection ratio. What that usually means is if you're running a signal into both the inverting and the non-inverting uh, input. You run into two wires and both of those wires go increase and decrease in voltage at the same time by the same amount. It's not going to be seen on the output. In other words, one's not ahead of the other or behind the other in its effect on the output. So there's a rejection ratio there. And that's a really good thing when you're running signals in uh, if you can get it so that you're having it go to both the positive and the negative, the inverting and the non-inverting input, uh, it causes it to not affect the output. And that's one of the whole advantages of op amps, by the way. Okay, now we get into some other kind of interesting things here. This is called slew rate. That gets into where they are using this test response right here, this test uh, equate, uh, circuit, and what they're doing, they've got a load resistance, a load capacitance, and then they're running a square wave input into it. Okay, they were running a square wave, uh, plus or minus 10 volts, so that's a big one. And as they run that into there, and they have this for load resistance, 2K, which means they've got it loaded down pretty good. Uh, smaller is a bigger load, and 2K, if you remember back in our DC talk, is about as low as you want to go on this op amp. And uh, as they do that, they, uh, they get the voltage increases at 1.5 to 2.2 volts per microsecond. So, in other words, it's pretty close to being square on the output. Now, pretty close means if I'm looking at something that's uh, relatively slow, 
pretty close means it looks square. If I'm looking at something that's in the megahertz range, the period of a megahertz is one microsecond, so this is not too good. And that just goes right back to the same thing with our frequency response. It's just another way of saying that. It takes the thing a little bit of time to move up, and so therefore it's not going to work at high frequencies. Rise time is the same kind of equation. It's just uh, measuring how fast that edge of the square wave moves up once we put it in there. And you see that they're using a lot smaller signal here, 20, 20 millivolts. All the other values are the same. Um, but the square wave, it takes it 0.3 microseconds. Again, that's fast to me, thinking in human terms. If I'm working on something in the megahertz range, that means it's going to distort it somewhat. Overshoot. Overshoot means we run a square wave in there. Does it end up coming right back to where it should be on the square wave, or does it tend to go past the point and then... After it goes past the point, it usually swings back down, goes past the point again, and maybe goes through about three oscillations before it ever gets up zeroed. And that's the same thing as in the video I had where I had to hammer on the rubber band. It's also what happened back in the old days when you would be uh, checking your car, check the shocks on it. That's what we Americans call the shocks. The British call the dampers which is really actually more what the, the uh, devices do on an automobile. If you didn't have very good shocks and you would, what we call, jounce the car, in other words, you'd push down on it and then let off real quick, the car would uh, overshoot, bounce back up past the point, and then go back down, and then go back up, and go back down, and that meant your, shot, your shocks were shot. And uh, I'm getting tongue-tied here. And this also has to do with that. How much overshoot does it do? Yeah, I'm sorry. I guess that's where I am on that. How much overshoot does it do? It does 15%. That's a pretty big amount. Uh, that's a pretty large amount right there, 15%. Um, and so we might have to deal with that when we come up with our external circuit. Okay, let's see. This gain bandwidth is kind of a funny number, but what it says is that as you increase the gain, you're going to decrease the amount of bandwidth. And if you have unity gain, you're going to have approximately 5.5 megahertz of uh, bandwidth. Actually, we came up with down here, we had about, I'd say, 13 megahertz of bandwidth. Uh, when we had when we got down to unity gain, but um, that also was open loop gain. Uh, if we go to unity gain, it would go up to 5.5 megahertz. If we have a gain of two of a uh, two dB gain, or gain of two, I guess we'd have end up with uh, about. 2.75 megahertz, and so on and so forth. As we start increasing the gain, the bandwidth is going to decrease. And that's basically what they're saying right there. Okay, total harmonic distortion. Total, har total harmonic distortion is a measurement of how well the output waveform matches a sine wave. And there's a big long formula. We haven't dealt with it in our... Uh, on the website, just take my word. It just means basically how good of a uh, how good the output matches the input. You see that this one thing right here, where they're running a large signal in, they have it less than five percent. Five percent is pretty lousy. Uh, up here, though, that's a real good number right there at one kilohertz. With a gain of 20 dB, load resistance of 2 megahertz, I'm sorry, 2 kilo ohms, and they're getting a voltage output of 2 volts peak to peak, it's doing a pretty good job of matching what the, uh, what the input is. And then this last one here, talking about noise voltage, as you can see,
as the denominator gets smaller, that would cause that noise, that factor to get bigger. And if it's remaining constant, then that means that the voltage out here would be getting would be getting less. So it's more at the low frequency than it is at the high frequency. Because if this number gets smaller, if this thing's going to stay the same, then this has to be getting smaller. And I, yeah, it's the square root of it. So yeah, it gets, it's more, it's more weighted toward the high frequency. I just screwed up there. Um, because it, it would be higher number at the numerator as the denominator got higher to maintain this number constant. So it's more toward the higher frequencies. Which, you know, if you think about electronics, whenever you've heard noise on it, it's a hiss. Final numbers, channel separation. And that's also in dB. And that means that one channel does not do much effect at all to the other channel. Because we have two op amps in this thing. And uh, that's pretty much everything to do with the AC response. Uh, and, and what this whole data sheet's about. So we've pretty well talked to the whole data sheet. I did a little chuck and jive there, but uh, not a lot. So I think, you know, I've pretty well explained this thing. Appreciate you listening. Hopefully you got something out of it. Thank you. This is Gary Fox.